Evening, everybody. There are several things I notice about myself. One in particular is that in the morning time, I can sing tenor, but by nighttime, I'm singing bass. <laughs> you can't sing at all. Someone said that. Yes, you can. Your heart's the one that's singing. It is great to see everybody here this evening. We have had an amazing weekend. I've been thinking about it a lot this weekend, about the body of Christ that is the church, about how we are saved by grace through faith. And this not of ourselves. The preeminence and the power and the beauty and the glory of our Jesus, our Savior. I've been thinking about the walking in a worthy manner a lot this weekend. I've been thinking a lot about the one body and the one spirit and the one hope and the one Lord and the one faith and the one baptism and the one God and Father above all, through all, in all. And thinking about my role in equipping the saints and thinking about my role in just being one of the saints to be equipped. I've been thinking about maturity and maturing in Christ I'm not done yet. I should never fool myself into thinking that I am. I've been thinking a lot about speaking the truth in love, wanting to make sure that I have a balance of both. This weekend has helped me with that. And one thing that's really stood out about being a part of the body of Christ being knit together is that sometimes we can... We can miss the fullness of the body when we get caught up of being a member of one congregation and miss that we are the member of the kingdom of God. One of the things that has been a blessing over the last several years, I think those of you have noticed it, that our spring renewals and our fall or spring connections and fall renewals, what we tried to do is to get brothers in Christ from the state of Michigan to come here and to fill the pulpit and to lead those thoughts. And one of the reasons behind that is to get us to see that we are a connected body here in this state. And we're blessed with so much gift and talent and truth and love. And brother, you have been a part of this this week that has been a blessing to us, Nick. This past spring, a blessing to us. And may we never forget that we're a part of the same body. To be equipped not only to help and to serve locally, but to make sure that we're connecting with you and you with us. Jim, I know that tonight you're going to finish things off. I hope you rested well this afternoon. But you've been a blessing, brother. Preach the word. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Your presence tonight exemplifies your hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus said they will be filled. I hope that you will be filled tonight. Amen. Human development often happens when intellectual experiences become real and emotional encounters. In other words, just because I'm talking, it doesn't mean that people are learning. And if by chance what I say does find place in your cognitive arena, and learning takes place, that still does not guarantee transformation. It's not until intellectual experiences coupled with real and emotional encounters that we begin to change. In that instance, our development in discipleship begins to progress. Anything less is a waste of my time, and it's a waste of your time. So understand, tonight, I want to engage with your intellect. 
I want to transfer information to you. That is revelation. But I don't want to stop there. I want to purposely disturb you to the point of discomfort. That is agitation. And then I want you to experience joy. That is jubilation. I found one of the best ways to do this is to utilize the same method that our Savior and Master Teacher Jesus employed so often. I want to do this with a story. But before I get to the story, let me predicate it with this. During our study in Ephesians, we were reminded in several places about the presence of the evil one. From the time Paul was in Ephesus and cast out the evil spirits there to this follow-up letter that we've been studying this weekend, at least three times he drew our attention to the principalities and the powers, sometimes using the phrase rulers of darkness to describe them. He wrote that there were those who still embraced darkness. Their understanding had been darkened and they were alienated from God and they were walking in darkness. He wrote that you once walked according to the course of this world and according to the power of the, the, the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Paul told them that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. But he also told them of the exceeding greatness of God and of his power towards us who believe which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. How that he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, the church. And he reminded them that by Christ, the devil and death has been defeated. Why, Paul? Why, Paul? Why did you care about these people so much? Why did you spend so much time with them? Why did you go through the hassle of writing this letter to them? I think that the answer is because he was well aware of this war for their soul and for your soul and for my soul. It's a war that's going on. It's a war that takes us back all the way to ancient times, ancient orient origins, and one that we can know that can be won. We can end triumphantly, but through Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, the devil tempted. Humans failed. Satan won the battle that day, and it was a big victory for him and a tragic loss for God and for his children, his creation. Please notice the devil's thread throughout the Bible, leading all the way up to our passages in Ephesus and in Ephesians and beyond. He is an intruder on everything that is good. He is an instigator of evil. He is provocative. He is audacious and he is sly. He is a deceptive liar and a taker of life. He is a destructive enemy. He has power and he has forces and he lays and he waits like a predator. He is his ability. He has this ability to be patient that allows him to wait and to pick the most vulnerable times to pounce and to plumber, plump, to pounce and to plunder and to pummel his prey. And we know that love is patient. But his total disdain for God and God's creation drives him to be patient too. Often the difference between victory and defeat comes down to a challenge between love and hate. Will our love produce more patience, steadfastness, endurance than what is produced by his hatred? He wins many battles, but ultimately his destiny is defeat. That, however, has not diminished his thirst to wage war against all humanity. In fact, his wrath has been bolstered. His forces has risen up against God in defiance. In Jude, verse 6, it explains that there were certain angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. Places like 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 reminds us that their defiance is not greater than God's dominion. 
they are cast down and their ultimate abode will always and forever be darkness. One way to rise up against God is to afflict his children. Stealing them would rob them from God. Hurting them would hurt their maker. Condemning them would take his son to the cross. So Satan rises up against God's people. This was the battle of Ephesus, and it's our battle. Notice some of the greatest people on earth, some of the greatest people that's ever lived have been vulnerable to his attacks. In Genesis 3, we have Adam and Eve. In Job chapter 2, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job. And in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, Satan desired to sift Peter like wheat. Do you know what that means to sift? Number one. You spread wheat on a hard floor of stone or a hardened ground and you beat it with a flail. That is called the threshing part. Step two, throw it in the air so that the loose chaff that has been separated from the grain will be blown away by the wind and the heavier grain falls back onto the ground. This is the winnowing part. And that's the process. And that's all fine for wheat. But a perversion of the process would be to apply it to something it wasn't intended for, such as the human soul. And Satan wanted to thresh and he wanted to winnow Peter as if he were dried, brittle, easily broken wheat that would be devoured. It's not just individuals. In 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1, Satan stood against Israel. In Revelation 12 and verse 10, he is the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God day and night with an unquenchable diet for death. He has consumed the souls of multitudes. In 2 Peter 2 verse 25, he lays snares to take people captive. In 2 Peter 5 and verse 8, he is a lion prowling around seeking whom he may devour. And can you imagine, he even dared to approach God himself with temptation when Jesus took on flesh and came to this earth. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record it. Matthew and Luke give almost an identical description of the time that the devil approached Jesus himself. Mark only states this, that he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. That's Mark chapter one and verse 13. You see, Jesus was hungry after fasting for 40 days and he was lonely and he was weak. In other words, he was vulnerable. And that's what a predator looks for. Vulnerable prey. Maybe it's the lonely teenager on her phone late at night. She's been put down, let down, and now she's intrigued by a message that starts out, you are so pretty. She is vulnerable. And the devil is preying upon her. Maybe it's the husband in a dead-end job. His boss barely knows his name. He has kids who are growing way too fast and a wife who offers very little or no affirmation. But the bottles of booze and the seductive photos offer temporary soothing for, his susceptible, for this susceptible man. He is in the devil's snare. Or maybe it's the teenage boy. He's the captain of the team, cheered at every game, honored by younger children. He has his car and he has his girl and often he has his way. He stands tall with pride and he forgets the warning about the fall that comes to those who stand so tall. And someday he, he looks back and he says, I had it all. And he wonders what happened. He thought he was strong, but he was at risk and tempted and he fell. And now his life is defined by regret and the devil smiles. His trap was successful. Or it's the wife who is, who is constantly told she's to this or she's to that. She feels unloved and she's lonely. Time has been rough on her and she finds no words of grace nor tenderness. But recently, the prowling predator, predator as gleefully watched and waited as a kind and gentle man has taken notice of this woman who is another man's wife who has been sifted and threshed and winnowed. And now she is ready for the taking. It's Jesus in the wilderness exposed to the elements and the beast 
weak and hungry and vulnerable. That's when Satan watches. When that time is right, that's when he paralyzes his prey with a roar and an attack. He's often in the bushes, patiently hiding in the weeds and until reality until the re, until reality beats on us like wheat on the threshing floor. Until then he's undercover and oftentimes just unnoticed and then a shocking blindside attack leaves us stunned and dismayed. I believe love and loyalty led Jesus to enduring the three temptations. One of those temptations promised no more battle for dominion if you will fall down and worship me. Two of them began with, if you are the son of God, an assault on his identity designed to instill doubt of his purpose. And finally, Matthew recorded Jesus commanding, away with you, Satan. And the devil left him. Success. Victory, 40 days leading up to a one day at least siege. And the devil came to him to destroy him and thereby destroy you and destroy me and destroy our hope and our future and our salvation. But it didn't happen, not on that day. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. His resilience manifested in resistance. His love was stronger than Satan's hate. His authority was greater than that of the darkness of his realm. But the next phrase that we read in Luke's account is what bothers me so much. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 13, on the same event, the Bible says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That's unsettling to me. He'll be back. Among all the devil is, he is tenacious. I mean, outright, absolutely downright, pestilent, and will not stop. He may depart, but it's until an opportune time. And of course, he did return to Jesus again on another day, but that time it seemed to be more unexpected, more of a blindside. He had overcome the temptation that began with, if you are the son of God, and his disciples were embracing the realization that their teacher was in fact the son of God. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Indeed, there had been an intellectual breakthrough. They were beginning to understand and to get it. Now with this revelation in place, Jesus began to speak to them about something that was difficult to deal with. How he would go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. This was agitation. The scriptures tell us that this was a deeply troubling thought for Jesus. He would be betrayed and become so very vulnerable and abused. And this same Peter in the same chapter, Matthew chapter 16, the same Peter who had just made this great confession only seven verses earlier, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that, that this one who he was speaking to, this Peter, he begins to rebuke Jesus. Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Sometimes, especially in vulnerable times, what we want to hear is not what we need to hear. In times of distress, the tempter will often whisper to us the very thing that will lead us, that will lead the feeble to more failure. In this case, he asserts it from a friendly face, that of Peter. This shall not happen to you, said Peter. Jesus turned to Peter and he said to Peter something similar to what he said in the wilderness. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. His response was direct and it was forceful and it was aimed at Satan, even though it was Peter who uttered the words. 
The hands of fleshly people may have nailed him to the cross, but his battle was not with flesh and blood, but always with Satan. And so is ours. What Satan through Peter had laid out before Jesus was an offense. Therefore, he needed to put it behind him. Not today, Satan. You've come up against my people. You've caused deception, discord, disorder, and death. But you'll not raise the victory banner today. Away with you again. Even in the betrayal, it was not between Judas and Christ. The slyness of the evil one had, had, had not prevailed in the wilderness attack, nor through his, uh, his close apostle Peter. So he turns again to the inner circle. Another one of the twelve, this time Judas. In John chapter 13 and verse 1, it reminds us that Jesus loved his own to the death. In verse 2, it tells us that the devil had already put it in his heart, in Judas's heart, to betray him, to betray Jesus. This betrayal, of course, would ultimately lead to the death of our Savior a cruel punishment for which he didn't deserve, a humiliating display of threshing and winnowing by the most evil, vulgar, and perverted of all the universe. At the scene of the killing of Jesus, it must have seemed like a day of defeat for the king and for his kingdom. Like in the Garden of Eden, this was not only personal, it would be a defeat for all humanity. Spiritual darkness ruled the day until three days later. Three days later, as the stone was rolled back, with our mind's eye, we stand at the empty tomb and we say, not that day either. There are many defeats and victories still in our time. Every time the gospel is preached and somebody concludes, this is the day I will obey it. This is the day of my new birth. This will be the day of immersion into his death, burial, and resurrection, where I receive my seal for all eternity as a child of God. This is a day of victory. Yet for many, victory comes through many struggles. Some daily battles are lost. Satan wins with distractions and disorder and envy and lust and greed and uncontrolled anger and misguided priorities and procrastination, and it just goes on. All things that keep us from obedience to the faithfulness all things the Ephesians battled and things that we also battled. I know that Roxana did. She battled these things. The first time I recall hearing about her was at church in a worship service. She was a neighbor of Kevin and Amy, a young couple in our congregation. She was terminally ill. She lived alone with nobody to help her through her illness. So Kevin and Amy kept an eye out for her. Now Roxana had a way of keeping people at bay. And so Kevin and Amy did what they could, always mindful of their boundaries. But when a February thaw came, uh, when, a warm, when, a, when a February warm front came and brought about an unexpected thaw, the snow melted and Amy noticed the newspapers piled up around her neighbor's house. Nothing had been stirring in her house for an unusual amount of time. And so they called the police and asked for a wellness check. It was a good thing. Roxana was near death. She had fallen and been laying on her floor for several days. She was rushed to the hospital and Amy asked the church to pray for her. And that was the first time I had ever heard about this woman, Roxana. After staying in the hospital and being treated for multiple health ailments, Roxana was eventually able to return home. Kevin and Amy continued to do uh, what good neighbors do and they helped her often. The more her health declined, though, the more there was to do. And to be completely honest, there were times that she was demanding and she wanted more from them. From day to day domestic tasks to doctor visits, grocery shopping, picking up prescriptions. So many of you can relate. There, there's so much need out there. And early on, I had offered to visit. My offer, however, was declined. You see, her disease made it difficult for her to visit. The most visible and affected part of her body by the disease was hidden behind a face mask. The decaying flesh around her mouth and the side of her face made it difficult for her to talk, much less to eat or to drink. Not only that, but there was also the embarrassment that came from being seen by others in this condition. Eventually, 
Her needs became such that my mother, who is with us tonight, my mother was allowed an entrance into her home and into her life. She partnered with Amy to help carry the burdens. She took her places, waited for her during her appointments. She did all those things for Roxana that she has done for so many others over the years, and in doing so, she discovered lots of things about Roxana. Like that she was still employed with a good job, though she was on sick leave. How that she liked to grow plants and vegetables, and that she was a generous person. In fact, her generosity, her generosity seemed to be her love language. Sadly, there were other things that she found out about Roxana as well. She struggled with maintaining relationships. Aside from her life, uh, her life saving, aside from her life saving neighbors, and now my mother, she really had nobody. Some people in her life had passed, such as her parents, but others were simply shut out one by one. There's no husband, no children, no siblings. None of them were to be contacted under any circumstance, not even terminal illness and not even death. She could be bitter and she could be demanding. She was a classic hoarder and she had several cats. And as a result of her debilitating disease, she was no longer able to maintain or care for her cats, nor her unsanitary house, nor her decomposing flesh. I mean no offense when I say this, but had often wonder how people like Amy and my mother could look past stuff that makes humanity grotesque and still display compassion. Not just say words of compassion, but actually engage and display it. The answer, of course, is in their discipleship. Jesus did those kinds of things. A disciple imitates their teacher. It's discipleship that moved the earliest learners to reach out, to step out, and to love like the master. It's discipleship that causes people to do the same today. And I'm ashamed to say it. But I became more, as I became more aware of the details of her circumstances, I began to reason within myself to justify my passiveness. At least I tried to visit. I mean, at least I made an offer. Perhaps they, those already involved and acclimated, would be able to do what needed to be done without my own personal involvement. And so I was satisfied, but that would soon change. Do any of you have one of those mothers who is not afraid to tell the world about you? Those moms that despite knowing your faults and your failures, say only good things? If you're like me, you try to live outside of the limelight. So when you're the worst player in little league team and everybody knows it except for your mother who shouts praises from the stands, it sometimes can be a little bit of an awkward situation. These mothers tell others about you. Mary seems to have put Jesus in a similar circumstance during the wedding in Cana of Galilee. When there was a wedding and then the wedding party ran out of wine before Jesus was ready or had even agreed, she somehow knew that he would do something and he commanded the servants to do whatever he said. And even Jesus seems to be roped in by his mother to do something that only a mother could request. Now you should also know I don't have a very good sense of smell, but don't feel bad for me. I usually consider this a blessing <laughs> because I also have a very sensitive gag reflex. I mean, I'm the husband and the dad that gags over everything. The smell of a dog, what the dog leaves behind. All of that will leave me red eyed and physically hurting from the force of retching. It happens with many things, diapers, dumpsters, hospital smells, and just about wherever an odor looms. The smell, and, and some of the, the worst, is what is conjured by cats, trapped indoors and trash left behind by human negligence. So you can imagine my quandary when the phone rang and my mother said, I've talked to Roxana about you, and finally well, she has agreed to meet you in her house. As best as I can remember, and I hope if Roxana is in any way cognitive of the story that she's laughing with us, as best as I can remember, I said, okay, great. 
Will such and such day work? Okay, fine. Give me your address and I'll be there. By this time, it was early summer. When I approached her door, it was vividly recognizable that this poor woman had long been unable to tend her own home, having been warned of the elements and the odors. I dabbed some peppermint under my nose so as not to gag and to offend her, and then I knocked on her door. When the door opened, I saw a withered shell of a woman only a little bit older than myself. Her thin head of hair was mostly hidden under a crooked headscarf. Her decomposing flesh was mostly hidden behind her face mask. I was invited inside. From the doorway, I could see this was going to be trouble for me. And what about those cats? The mess, the smell, the garbage, the cats, my allergies. The only thing that moved me inside her house was the only thing that had carried me this far an overwhelming sense of discipleship. This is what a disciple of Christ would do, right? This is what Jesus would do. I would do it for him, surely not for myself. Note, I'm embarrassed to admit some of this, but my discipleship compels me to do what Christ would do even when my pathetic thought process tells me don't. After I entered, I quickly realized this was going to be difficult, if not impossible. It was a beautiful day outside. So I asked if we might visit outside, and she agreed and eagerly showed me her containers of plants and vegetables that she had mustered the strength to put together earlier in the spring. It was difficult to understand her words. The words uh, of her mouth were veiled by the mask, and her mouth was impeded by the decay of the disease. Before I left, I asked if, if she was a reader, and she said that she was, so I gave her a book. You may know the book, the book that Jerry Tolman wrote, God's Eternal Plan, and I asked her to read it. It would, it would explain some things to her that she needed to know about Jesus and his church and salvation, and I thought that it would be a useful thing to prepare her for our further conversations and for what the medical workers call the end of the life phase. As the weeks went by, we stayed in touch, and we had visits and calls. One day, she was admitted to Hurley Hospital. They placed her alone at the end of a hallway in a corner room that could only be accessed through another small room. This seemed to be the place for someone who could be difficult to deal with and needed special accommodations due to the nature of their sickness, and now it had afflicted, that had afflicted her body so badly. On a certain day, I made a visit to the hospital. My daughter Bailey was with me. She was 15 years old at the time. And like Jesus and my mother, she has a way of overlooking plagues to see the person afflicted by the plague. You see, it's people like this that helps us bridge the intellectual experience to the real encounter. It was on this day that Roxana asked what she needed to do. She was talking about salvation. I had not forced the question. She knew how this was going to end, and so she asked the question. We talked about the book that I had given her and she had read, and yet she admitted that there was so, there, that in so many words that even though she had read it and we had discussed things, there were still some things that she didn't understand very much. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I asked. Yes, she answered. Are you willing for however much time you have left to do the best that you can for him? Yes, she answered. The only thing left for you is to be baptized. Okay. How do we do that? She asked. Hmm. How do we do that? Well, I explained our options are to take you to the church building when you are released and we can get some assistance and you can be immersed there. Do we have to do that, she asked. Well, I continued, I'd rather not wait. If there is a way to do it here, will you do it? Yes, again, she answered. Okay, let me see what I can find out. By then, my mother was there. She and Bailey stayed with Roxana while I spoke to the staff about our request. Bailey and Roxana had immediately hit it off very well with each other. The two of them went on their way to the gift shop where Roxana exercised her love language, and they had plenty of time to shop because I had a difficult process to figure out. 
I immediately texted the elders and asked that they would pray about this, these circumstances. Next, I asked the hospital social worker if perhaps the hospital chaplain could recommend an accommodation for baptism. We had to get Roxana baptized that day. How would you find, or how would you find, how could you find the facilities to do this? Would the staff be helpful? What about her physical ability, or rather her physical disability? After all, she was in a wheelchair and her wounds were open. Of course, my intentions were questioned. Again, isn't there any other way? After a brief discussion about the doctrine of baptism, I, I soon chose a different approach. I told the hospital worker that this would give this woman peace. Whether you understand or whether you agree or not, this will benefit your patient. By this time, the elders had been praying and she agreed to help. She spoke to a nurse who spoke to another nurse who made some calls. Eventually, arrangements were made. The hospital had a rehab room that is set up like a small apartment for patients to learn how to go about day-to-day -day tasks. It included a kitchen, a bed, a bathroom, and a tub. Before this day, these helpful nurses didn't even know that this little room existed in the hospital. When we arrived at the small room, the kindest, most helpful nurses I've ever encountered partnered with us. They packed her wounds in preparation for the baptism. They filled the tub with warm water and began to transfer, transfer her from the wheelchair to the tub. The warm water didn't seem to soften the firm surface of the metal tub at all. Standing outside the door of the tiny bathroom, I heard Roxana holler because of pain. Her body was aching. The movement hurt her body, and her body was only that of skin and bones. And then it was lowered down under the hard sur surface, and she groaned, and she began to utter, utter words of distress and doubt. She seemed to be backing out, but we'd come so far. We can't stop now. I encouraged her, we need to go a little further, Roxana. I'll be quick, and I'll be gentle. I would not put you through this, if it wasn't necessary. Once she was in the tub, she screamed with pain as her rigid body waited on the hard surface. Based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. And as soon as I lifted her up from the water, the nurses, along with my mother and my daughter, were there with dry towels and warm and gentle hugs. Looking back on that day, I don't see a woman burdened by her physical and emotional maladies as much as I see one who had been sifted, thoroughly thrashed, and winnowed. But she had been prayed for, like Peter. And when she landed from being tossed about, she landed safely in the arms of Christ. As I stood back from the tub and the ladies ministered to her, I heard Roxana say, Today, the devil almost won again, but not this time. Roxana never left the hospital. She died just a few days later, triumphantly. Now, what about you? If we can assist you with a spiritual need, will you come while we stand and while we sing?